Welcome to the 2015 Annual Meeting of the American Academy of Neurology in Washington, D.C. This is the world's largest gathering of neurologists with over 13,000 attendees who are here to attend the latest scientific research advances <coughs> in brain disease. My name is Andy M. Holton. I'll be moderating today's press conference. We are joined by members of the press in attendance at the annual meeting and by conference call. Today we welcome Dr. Alan Krumholtz and Dr. Jacqueline French, lead authors of the American Academy of Neurology and the American Epilepsy Society's guideline, Evidence-Based Guideline, Management of an Unprovoked First Seizure in Adults. The research will be published tomorrow in Neurology, the medical journal of the American Academy of Neurology, and is strictly embargoed until 4 p.m. Eastern Time today. The guideline is endorsed by the following organizations. The American Neurological Association, and the World Federation of Neurology. Dr. Krumholtz is a professor of neurology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and director of the Veteran Affairs Epilepsy Center of Excellence for the Northeast Region and the Maryland Healthcare System. He is also a fellow of the American Academy of Neurology. Dr. Jacqueline French is a professor of the Department of Neurology and co-director of the Epilepsy Research and Epilepsy Clinical Trials at the New York University Langone Comprehensive Epilepsy Center. Dr. French is a fellow of the American Academy of Neurology and she is also the Chief Scientific Officer for the Epilepsy Foundation. After our lead author's presentation today, we'll first take questions by those in attendance here in Washington, D.C., and then from those journalists on the phone. Please use the microphone in the center of the room when asking questions, and remember to identify yourself and your media outlet. Just a reminder again that there is an embargo on the, these presentations of 4 p.m. Eastern Time today, and a video of the, this press conference will be posted on YouTube later today. Welcome, Dr. Krumholtz and French. Uh, thank you, Mr. Imholt, and uh, good morning. We're here to today to discuss a uh, new or the latest American Academy of Neurology guideline on when to treat a first seizure in adults. This is titled an evidence-based guideline management of an unprovoked first seizure in adults. Seizures are very important problems. One out of every 10 people will experience a seizure at some time in their lives. About 3% of people will have recurrent seizures, or what we call epilepsy, defined as a disorder of the brain characterized by recurrent, unprovoked seizures, which are seizures not due to an acute precipitating cause, such as, for example, a low blood sugar. Each year, 150,000 adults in the United States will experience an unprovoked first seizure. Even one seizure is a traumatic physical and psychological event that poses major adverse social consequences, such as loss of driving privileges and limitations on employment. I'm reminded of a specific example of this in a young woman who I recently cared for. She's a suburban single working mother who experienced her first seizure. Things seemed to be fine in terms of uh, her dealing with this until we got to the discussion of driving. When I explained to her that she would not be able to drive because of this seizure, she was devastated. She said, Dr. Krumholtz, if I can't drive, you may as well cut off my legs. I won't be able to take my children to school, and I won't be able to go to work. Recurrent seizures pose even more serious costly and disabling problems. A 2007 practice guideline that Dr. French and I were involved with <coughs> addressed the evaluation of an unprovoked first seizure in adults. This is the next installment of that topic. Here we analyze the evidence regarding prognosis and therapy of a first seizure in adults. Let me give you some background on this. It is now a generally accepted principle that after a patient with a first seizure has one or more ensuing seizures, an anti-epileptic drug should be initiated because the risk of yet additional seizures is so high in the range of 75% by four years, with risk increasing proportionally after each subsequent seizure as the time interval between the seizures shorten. 
So treatment of, a, of two recurrent seizures is a generally well-accepted standard, which this guideline supports. In contrast, immediate anti-epileptic treatment at the time of an unprovoked first seizure is not well accepted and is debated. And this is the topic that our guideline addresses and for which we provide advice. So to address this, our group or our, the authors on our guideline looked at several questions to try to determine uh, what the uh, advice should be for clinicians and patients who have experienced the first seizure. The first question we asked is for the adult who presents with an unprovoked first seizure, what is their prognosis or what is the risk of recurrent seizures? And evidence shows that within the first two years after a first seizure, the risk of recurrence is substantial in the range of 21 to 45 percent. Importantly, there are clinical risk factors that are clearly associated with the risk for recurrent seizures. And those risk factors essentially double the risk of a subsequent seizure for an individual with these risk factors. And these risk factors include a prior brain insult, such as a stroke or head trauma, an EEG with epileptiform abnormalities, or what we, I would describe as spikes or sharp waves on the EEG, a significant brain imaging abnormality, and a nocturnal seizure, which is a seizure that occurs uh, from sleep. So those are some of the risks for a seizure. What can one do about a seizure? Well, we asked that question by asking, in an adult presenting with an unprovoked seizure, does immediate treatment with an anti-epileptic drug change the short-term two-year prognosis for seizure occurrence? And that was important because we found that the greatest risk for seizure recurrence was within the first two years. And what our guideline found in terms of the evidence that it reviewed is that immediate anti-epileptic therapy indeed is uh, beneficial and is likely to reduce the risk for a seizure recurrence in the first two years by approximately 35%. So then the next question we asked is, what is a long-term prognosis for patients with a first epileptic seizure? And does immediate anti-epileptic drug therapy, as opposed to the usual standard of waiting until a second seizure occurs uh, to start treatment, change that prognosis? And we found that over the longer term, uh, meaning beyond three years, immediate anti-epileptic drug therapy is unlikely to improve the prognosis for what we call a sustained seizure remission, meaning no seizures or being seizure-free for at least two to five years. Uh, so it's not like to, likely to improve that prognosis. But I would add that in general, the prognosis for patients, whether they're immediately treated with anti-epileptic drugs or one waits until they have a second seizure, is generally pretty good. And about 75% of these people become seizure-free. So then the last question we posed was that for the adult who presents with an unprovoked first seizure, what are the nature and frequency of adverse events with anti-epileptic drug treatment? And what our guideline found, based on the available evidence, is that the risk for anti-epileptic drug adverse effects ranges from 7 to 31 percent. But fortunately, these adverse events are predominantly mild and reversible. So for example, if a person is on an anti-epileptic drug in this situation and has an adverse event, one can reduce the dose of medication or change the individual to another medication and uh, that corrects the problem in most cases. So what is our conclusion? Well, this guideline advises when to treat seizures with anti-epileptic drugs, but it cannot give a simple black and white recommendation whether an adult with a first seizure should immediately be started on an epilepsy drug. What we can say, and what is very important, is that these decisions need to be made on an individualized basis. Clinicians' anti-epileptic drug treatment recommendations or advice should weigh individualized seizure recurrence risks against the benefits and adverse effects of anti-epileptic drugs and importantly, consider informed and educated patient preferences on this matter. So thank you for your attention, Dr. French. Thank you, so I'm gonna try and give a little bit of the 
patient perspective and imagine that, you know, because we're talking about adults who this is a very unexpected event for them. And I have lived through this with uh, many of my patients. They're going along, you know, just living life and suddenly out of the blue a seizure occurs. And it's a very impactful event for many people and it's a very scary event. They come to the doctor and a lot of doctors are sort of taught or have been taught to say, this is a single seizure, it is not yet epilepsy, so we're going to have a watching and waiting stance. And actually, this is a very timely uh, guideline because the International League Against Epilepsy is also reconsidering what the definition of epilepsy is. And the new definition of epilepsy says that a single seizure can indeed be epilepsy because the definition of epilepsy is really that you are in a situation where your brain has a tendency to have more seizures, whether it is tomorrow or a year from now or uh, in, in some cases five or 10 years from now. So that's the situation people find themselves in. And I can liken this to, let's say you have a fire in your house and you bring the inspector in to see why you had the fire. And the inspector can either say, you know, you left the, you left the, uh, the iron uh, plugged in and that's why you had the fire. That's sort of a provoked seizure, right? Just unplug the iron next time you'll be fine. But the inspector might say, look, I looked around at your wiring and I saw that there's a little bit of faulty wiring there. And you know, it could be perfectly fine. But there is a small possibility that this faulty wiring could in fact cause a seizure, or I'm sorry, cause a fire somewhere down the line. And this is similar to what we do when we evaluate a patient and we say, the MRI is not normal or the EEG is not normal. We found a little bit of faulty wiring. Whether that faulty wiring is going to lead to another seizure, we can't say. But when the inspector gives you that information and says, look, it's gonna cost you a lot of money to fix it and it may never cause you another problem, then it is up to you to decide what it is you want to do. And we're here to say that the, that the person who had the seizure their individual voice needs to be heard loud and clear in this. If this is somebody who, for example, is a trial lawyer, who might uh, have the second seizure in the middle of a trial case and that might destroy their career, or a teacher who is in front of small children, then their decision might be very different than somebody who, for example, um, has, has different uh, uh, things going on in their life and they, they feel like they are willing to wait and see whether they need medication or not. It's a very individual decision. The type of seizure that people had, whether they want to uh, start driving as soon as possible because if they don't get treated and they have another seizure, that's going to push back the clock, of course, for when they can start driving again. So all of these things are going to go into somebody's decision. you know. And, and you may be sitting there thinking, well, you know, people are gonna be taking drugs and there's a 50-50 chance that they may never have had another seizure anyway. But in fact, in, in medicine, we often treat people not because of what they have, but because of what we don't want them to have. So probably some people sitting in this room here are taking antihypertensives or statins. And in fact, for every person who takes a statin, 22 people who take statins would never have had a stroke or a heart attack. They take statins because they don't wanna be number 23 who does have the stroke or the heart attack. So taking a medication, if you're tolerating it well and you're not having any problems with it, taking a pill every morning, and fortunately our medications uh, now often can be taken once a day, which is pretty easy and straightforward, may be a reasonable trade-off for some people not to be that one out of two. And now, of course, we do have, and I think it's really important, we have some indicators that it's one out of two instead of one out of five, for example. Um, you know, the, the good news is that medicines in general work and they can prevent seizures in the future. So overall, when we look at our population, we find that two thirds of people will get good control of their, of their seizures with medication and one third may have some difficulty and we call those people treatment resistant. But for the two thirds who will get control of seizures with medication, these medications should give them prevention of that subsequent seizure should that subsequent seizure be going to happen. So uh, th the message here is to uh, definitely 
have a conversation with people and don't make a knee-jerk reaction in one direction or the other, treat or not treat. The other point that I wanted to bring up is that often the seizure that brings people to the doctor is the seizure that people think about when they you know, watch uh, Grey's Anatomy or, or the television shows where, oh my goodness, they're having a seizure and somebody falls on the ground and they're convulsing and they shake all over and they're, you know, so, you know, they're, they're obviously in a very bad way. But in fact, that is not the most common type of seizure. The most common types of seizures are actually much more subtle than that. And they can just be a minute or two of people uh, staring off, being inattentive to conversation, uh, having unusual behavior for a minute or two, uh, or just having a sudden feeling out of nowhere that seems inappropriate for the environment, a sudden feeling of fear or a sudden deja vu that's very strong and overwhelming. Uh, and unfortunately, often people have these things for months to years and don't know what to do about it, don't know that it could be a seizure. And then, in fact, it's only when they have the very dangerous convulsion where they fall over or they could be driving or they shake all over, or they can fall, they can drown, uh, that that brings them to medical attention. So. We do want people to think and know that if they have small events, they should get checked out and see whether there's any faulty wiring that's causing it uh, and see whether medication is uh, a reasonable option for them. Thank you. Thank you.